Good morning. Good morning, Keith. How how are you in uh, Van Wert, Ohio? Soon not to be to live there, but yeah, not for very much longer. Three days. Three days. Wow. Yeah, yeah. We close on the house on Monday, but I'm doing okay. It's a cooling down a little bit. It's like seventy something outside, so I'm. This gives me the opportunity to open some windows and have it not be eighty four degrees in the apartment. So <laughs> are that's, you moving to the big city? Aren't you? Yes, moving to Fort Wayne. So the big city of like not you know that many people significantly bigger than where i'm living here but more than one stoplight yeah hey there's more than one stoplight there are actually a ton of stoplights in this dinky little town to where it takes forever to drive a very short distance just because (laughs) you can get caught behind like nine red lights well they might have they might have air conditioning in fort wayne as well Oh, I guarantee you they have air conditioning in fort wayne i'm gonna sleep (laughs) on my floor before any furniture is delivered because it's just going to be easier that way but yeah, so uh, you want to get into the the meat of all the things that have been going on for the extended duration that we've been away? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to work on Chronic too much. I have two talks, two brand new talks that are, well, one that I already did and another one that's coming up. And so... Um, I worked on a talk called, uh, which is centered around chronic. So our findings from chronic and things like that, it's called how to build a WebSocket API in Elixir. Uh, and I gave that one already in Grand Rapids, uh, Michigan. Nice. And the cool thing with that is it, so there's only about 20 people in the talk, but about four of them came up and said they can't wait for chronic to come out. <sighs> um, which was a good sign. It was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but we kind of shared some of the secrets that we use with, with chronic, which is cool. And then the other thing that's been taking my time, the other talk is um, a talk on a new bot framework that I'm working on uh, called Juve. It's a bot framework in Elixir and uh, it's different than the kind of Slack wrappers that are out there right now. Um, in that it's going to work with a bunch of different pl- platforms. Uh, right now I'm just concentrating on Slack, but, Uh, And it's kind of going to morph into like an MVC type framework for bots. So you'll create controllers and actions based on messages and things like that. So that's, that's been cool in the fact that it's like making me really, really comfortable with Elixir. Nice. Yeah. You've been uh, occasionally reaching out and just asking opinions on things or kind of showing me some code and yeah, it looks really cool. It's nice that it's uh, kind of, outside of the the scope of like a phoenix app which i think a lot of people who come from ruby and rails like that's kind of where we first dive in is like oh check this out phoenix it's like rails but faster right and that's really how i ended up learning ruby really well was um just concentrating on ruby itself instead of rails and Mm -hmm. when i built my first application uh, you, you really kind of like dive into like the nooks and crannies of stuff. Like you'll see it in code and you're like, oh, that's cool, but you don't really know what it does. And so I've learned kind of like Elixir is processes all the way down. Um, I've I've learned a lot about OTP and stuff because uh, Juve, like everything is a process that sends messages in between the processes. So connections to Slack is a process. There's a supervisor that watches over those all the bots are going to be a process and a supervisor that watches over those um, and how to kind of architect those supervisors uh, and workers. So um, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. The the book, the OTP guide, the little Elixir and OTP guide book um, was very helpful in learning all that. Uh, So I'd highly recommend that book, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's been fun. So I'm still working on that, that framework uh, for my talk. Um, this talk isn't going to dive into the MVC bits at all. Um, but I'm giving this talk three more times. Um, so it'll improve, uh, upon each, each time I give it. Cause I'll, I'll be working on that, that open source, but yeah, I've, I've reached out to you a few times because like, man, doing open source by yourself is not when there's like nobody watching the project and you don't get feedback from others. Mm-hmm. So it's been helpful to kind of bounce ideas off of you. And Yeah, I don't think I was as helpful as I would have liked to have been because for the most part, I was like, wait, what is what is this doing? Well, yeah, I mean, we had like 30 minutes. It's hard uh-huh. to kind of like, you know, hey, here's the whole background of why I'm doing yeah. this. And 
on then yesterday i sent you a message telling saying like hey you should namespace that thing it seems kind of weird that it's just like a bare module out there and you're like that's an external thing i'm like oh yeah. okay see i would have never got that i totally thought that was your own module yeah, yeah it's um i'm using a um hex package called pubsub mm-hmm. which is basically literally just it broadcasts a process that receives messages and then you can broadcast topics to pids so mm-hmm. pids can subscribe to messages and then uh, you can broadcast a, a topic with a message and all those pids get that so that's how i do things like when um a slack connection receives like a new a new connection from slack it mm-hmm. sends out a message that the bot factory uh, receives. And then the bot factory says, Oh, here's a new Slack message. And it starts up a new bot worker. Nice. It's a way to kind of, uh, broadcast messages in between, uh, PIDs pretty easily without like, ha- like without like coupling them together. So, uh, I prob I started actually writing this myself and then I noticed that this, this package was out there. Um, but I probably will write something else because it, it kind of needs a cue because the order of messages aren't received right away. So um, oh, gotcha. also I want to store messages in, in the queue just for retrieval and, and history purposes a bit. So, Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm wondering behind the scenes what it actually uses to do it. Like naive me thinks like, okay, you could probably use the, um, like the registry a little bit to, to sort of work off of stuff, or you could use like Erlang term storage. So ETS hmm. to, to create a bunch of things to, to, I mean, cause ETS is basically just Redis inside of Erlang. Right. So that's like one way to do it, but I might go look at the source code just so I can see how they do it. Just cause I'm, you know, not super knowledgeable in Elixir, but I already have like in my mind, like, Oh, this is how I would build that. Yeah. Knowing nothing, so it would be cool to see how somebody else did it. Well, this this package has no storage whatsoever, so it's just literally a process that you know sends a message to a PID. Um, you know, it keeps track of 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 the PIDs that are subscribed to a to a topic, and then when it receives a published command, it just loops through those subscribers. Oh, okay, gotcha. It's sends, a process yeah. that holds on to uh, its own state that is like a mapping of everything that subscribes to what. Uh, message type yep and then elixir you can just send the the kernel send message Mm -hmm. to any pid and um those if you're using um like a gen server type of thing or an agent or anything like that you can just have a handle info call and pattern match that message and that's how it works nice it's funny that i would still not directly go to that because i haven't written enough elixir to be like i don't keith you don't need you don't need to store it somewhere like working on this framework is like, that's like the trigger. Like as soon as I found like, like what is this application module and why do people use this? Like it's literally all processes. Like X unit is a process that has like a few other processes in it. And so like, once you've like noticed that switch, it's, it's pretty cool. It's, it's pretty simple actually. Uh, it's nice. pretty simple how or how thin like elixir the elixir layer is and how very very erlangish you know it's just built on top of erlang which is which is amazing so yeah uh, so that those are the two things i've been working on uh, f- instead of chronic so chronic i have you know it's been a month since the last time we talked so i have done a little thing little a few little things like uh, started working on the graphql implementation and we started talking about like a current user and we were doing a lot of work to have like an anonymous user. Like we thought, Oh, somebody's going to just download the app and just want to start using it. And so we were discussing, you know, Hey, we need some sort of anonymous user. Um, and then that can be switched over to like a real registered user once they sign up. But we kind of decided that that wasn't really worth it. And we should just, have people sign up for an account, um, you know, no credit card or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And then that way they'll see the full benefit of, of chronic, like right away. They won't just think it's, Oh, it's just another Pomodoro timer. So I like that decision that we made. 
Yeah, sometimes it's just best to punt on that stuff because I've still thought about it again and again. And I'm like, as cool as it would be to be able to, to like use it without needing any sort of sign up or anything like that, like half the the power is being able to, cre- I mean, more than half, I guess I would say, is the ability to create workflows, which we need to identify to somebody. And that uh, the extra step of having like a fake identifier that we can swap over later just seemed like it was going to be more work than it was maybe worth right away. Well, we could, um, yeah. So, so one of our, one of our things that we, we decided was like, Hey, if our onboarding is not as good or not as many people are signing up, like they'll down, like we notice that they download the app, but they're not signing up. Like we can just add that. We can just add the anonymous user functionality, Yep. you know, later. Um, but we could do things like create workflows through an anonymous, those would just be attached to an anonymous user. You know, mm-hmm. the things that we couldn't do are you couldn't share like the Pomodoro's wouldn't sync, right? Yep. Because we don't have, you know, you have an anonymous user on your Mac and you have an anonymous user on, on your iPhone. We don't know that those two are the same, so they can't sync. And that's kind of a major feature. And our, we would have the nightmare of like they create a workflow on their Mac as an anonymous user and then they yeah. create this, you know, something different <laughs> on their phone as an anonymous <laughs> user. We'd have to merge accounts and stuff. That would not be right. fun. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I like that decision. So we, we start working on the GraphQL implementation where the, the you know, the, there's a viewer kind of root node, um, that you see on like other, um, APIs like, uh, GitHub and, and Shopify, I believe as well. So we worked a little bit on that on chronic, uh, and uh, I'll continue that in the next, next few weeks as my talk kind of winds down my talk prep. Nice. Dude, I, I love every time you have to give talks just because I get to see your slide deck and be like, look at this. These are always good. They make me laugh every time. Like they're always well designed. Oh, that Elixir talk I spent, I always spend it like at least $200 on fonts because I'll like. Good Lord. Yeah. Because I'll think like, oh, this font goes, I usually use like my fonts. I'm like, oh, this font goes, you know, I usually kind of try to keep two different fonts, you know, similar to web, you know, a header font, and a, kind of a body font. Yeah. Or like an H1 font I think of as, and like an H2 or 3 font. But this time I spent an excess because a lot of times those, those, those two fonts don't go well together. Mm-hmm. Uh, once you start using them, you're like, oh, I just spent $60 on this <laughs> font family. <laughs> It's not a complete waste of money. You know, I have a pretty large collection of fonts that I've purchased, so that's nice. But, um, and then I started, you know, using illustrations where I'm using, um, like iStock Photo or what's the other illustration? I use a few different illustration things. Mm-hmm. And once I find a theme, I start purchasing all these illustrations. So I probably spent a good, five hundred dollars on this talk good lord man i'm gonna buy you a shirt that says i have font problems where every word is a different font and oh, just uh, let you that's wear that amazing shirt dude i'm gonna steal that idea you have plenty of fonts to work with so go for it <laughs> oh, that's irony you have to create all these fonts and then you have the same problem so then you'd have to buy your shirt yep yeah so how about how about you what have you been up to oh man i feel like and uber failure for the last couple weeks so my my big thing that i was trying by couple weeks i mean more than a month um i i was going to set up continuous deployment because i want i don't want to have to think about deployment anymore and i have like ptsd from uh a project in the past where i like built a whole application before really hashing out what it was going to look like to deploy this thing and then like had to pull an all-nighter to sort of try to get it to deploy on time well, the good thing with, with this is you don't have to pull all-nighters. But yeah, yeah, definitely not going to pull an all-nighter with this. But I still right. want it to just be smooth. Like, I want it to just be able to be deployed on its own. Like, we don't have to worry about it. We just have to. And the way I've created it, which I'll get to in a minute, is actually kind of nice to where we can kind of dictate when it deploys. But we can do that from within the Git repo. And uh, that's kind of cool because you haven't actually seen any of this stuff. Unless you've been checking out the my branch that I I've been not. pushing to. but. I, I was going to use Habitat because I was I just come mm-hmm. off of ChefConf and I was kind of on this high for like Habitat seemed really cool. I was going to dive into it. 
And I still think Habitat is pretty sweet, but I don't think it's good for stateful applications like what we're deploying because I can't figure out how to hook into it in order to run an upgrade for an OTP release. So I had to scrap that. I wasted a a fair amount of time, not wasted, I'd spent a fair amount of time learning a lot about Habitat just so I could figure out that like, oh, this totally is not going to work. So that was a a bit of a bummer. And then I... Why did you... Why did you decide it wasn't going to work? It was just you couldn't figure out the the hot swapping stuff. Yeah, that was it. Is because the like a very important thing for us is that since it's a stateful application that uh, mm-hmm. needs to maintain that state through a deploy and hot code swapping through like Erlang is fantastic. And like mm-hmm. it's our, this application, I, as far as I can think right now, would be really hard to do with any other. Like we would have to do a lot of like temporary storing things in databases in order to do this so like because we couldn't just maintain state in memory and that would that would really suck yeah i um <laughs> it's funny you said that because i i subscribe to the service called retro git uh-huh. which is kind of like a time hop for your git commits so it'll say like hey last year you worked on this and you know two years ago you worked on this which is pretty cool it's just a, a daily email that i get like, oh, yeah, four years ago I was working on this. Mm-hmm. But I, I got one the other day. It said, like, I was working on chronic Rails. And I remember trying to build chronic in Ruby and Rails. And I just couldn't imagine what a horrid monkey patch duct tape thing that would have been. Mm-hmm. Uh, and probably, yeah, it wouldn't have worked. So, yeah, I'm, like, this language is and platform is perfect for for what we're doing yeah i mean we would so what we would have to do in order to not use hot code reloading is we would murder a database is what would happen because every (laughs) single timer would write to the database every second and uh right yeah or redis well yeah i mean redis i consider redis as a database but i I guess it's a key value store but yeah so i'm like okay that's that would suck so that's why, you know, being able to do this in er, uh, Erlang's VM is pretty awesome. But actually getting it to work isn't wasn't that hard originally. But then I never wrote down how the hell I deployed the application before. So I'm coming into this going, OK, I don't remember how to do any of this stuff. And uh, yeah, because you had the hot code reloading working through a deployment before. But, so what were you using before that you didn't want to continue using? So the way I, the way I was doing that before was I had the entire mix project on the machine and I would ideally not want, I don't want to do that because so the way that works is like same way we would deploy a rails application. You have to ship the source code to the server. You run whatever it is that you're going to be using as your app server and your web server and this and that, and you get it to go. Well, OTP releases package that whole thing up and you can package it up like with its own Erlang in it too. So you just like chuck a tarball over to a machine and then it has a binary that it can run that includes everything that it needs. And that is pretty awesome. So we can still, we can do that with OTP releases and that's effectively what I was doing before, but I was doing it with the entire source code package and using mix. And that's, that's the kicker is if you deploy an OTP release, you don't have access to mix which was something that I kind of, I must not have realized originally. And so now I'm like figuring out all these things that I have to do in order to actually get this deployed. And it's quite a bit more complicated than it was before. And I'm trying to do this in a continuous deployment way. I actually have the deployment pipeline figured out. It's the configuration of a server initially so that I can bootstrap it as an application server for Chronic and then figuring out how I deploy releases to that after the fact that has been a little Mm. bit complicated. So what are you, um, what are we using? What hosting provider are we using for that? So I, I mean, you could do this with any, any, uh, like VPS or whatever. We're using DigitalOcean because I had a bunch of credit mm-hmm. from, uh, Coder Journey and just be like referrals and stuff. So, and I thought I could continue to like funnel us free money for that, but it turns out you can't. Like I was able to like seed our, our little like, uh, chronic teams bank account on DigitalOcean <laughs> but now I can't give it any of the money that I get from that. So that's kind of funny. You're trying to hustle some DigitalOcean Bitcoin? What, what are you no, trying no, to do? No, no, no. It was, I mean, so I'm an affiliate for them. Like my mm-hmm. YouTube channel actually has some of the like, I had, did I ever tell you that I was the number one thing that you found if you searched Kubernetes at one point? 
yeah on youtube, yeah, on YouTube. like that was yeah, hilarious yeah. I, w- I had that and then i was the number two thing for docker machine and uh i have a video where it's like how to deploy docker stuff to DigitalOcean using docker machine and docker compose and that actually just gets quite a few referrals so every like month or two i get a thing it's like hey we've put 50 bucks in your account from somebody who signed up with your link and has spent enough money with us so here you go so how much are you up to let, uh, let, let the audience know. Let the audience know. I mean, probably not that much. I mean, I guess <laughs> we've I've spent a couple hundred dollars on um of of this free yeah. money on Chronic. Yeah. I think I I want to say I gave us a I seated us with like two hundred fifty bucks, and I spent like twenty five bucks a month on the Chef server that only manages one server right now. But it was it was there mostly just so I have something to play with. Nice. But yeah, I don't know how much my entire like referral amount has been. I bet it's over a thousand, but I haven't spent it, so I don't know. Yeah. So That's anywho, awesome. so we're just using a VPS. So it's literally just running an Ubuntu server. Uh, I manage it with, well, I am going to manage it. So this is the problem that I had, right? The first time I showed you like the proof of concept for hot reloading was that was just a snowflake server that I was just like hacking around on this machine until I got it to work. And gotcha. I didn't, I didn't automate any of that stuff because right, I'm an idiot. Right. And, uh, yeah, so now yeah, I'm it was like, kind of like your first first pass. Yeah, so. exactly. So I was, it was kind of a spike, and then I was like, yeah. okay, I'm gonna put this into Chef so that I know, like, I can just like have Chef go and configure a server to do this, and then I didn't. So that was unintelligent of me at the time, and uh, so now I have to come back to it and be like, how did this work, and what am I doing? <laughs> but uh, good news is I know a lot more about Chef now than I did back then. So the doing the Chef stuff is is actually really easy and i have that almost done so it'll be really nice eventually and i'm looking into how otp's like clustering works too because i think eventually if like enough people like the application we might need to scale it out beyond like the tiny server that i have it on and i'm wondering if it'll be easier for us to just scale out to a like because elixir kind of scales off of cpu like the number mm-hmm. of cores that you have in order to do things. So if mm-hmm. I can scale out horizontally to just a bunch of small RAM machines with like a couple of CPU cores, then that might be more beneficial to us. And since Elixir can cluster and have registered nodes to where it just speaks Elixir across the entire like network, uh, that can be pretty sweet. And so I want to kind of think about that now and sort of bake that into some of the ideas that I'm working on. Nice. But yeah, so that kind of brings me to, to where I'm at now. Uh, confi- like dove into Circle CI and got that figured out for how to do CI stuff and how to uh, get it to build our archives and whatnot. And the way that I got it for continuous deployment is I have set some stages. So when we merge something into master, it'll go through the process of running the tests and it'll go and it'll actually build the release for the application if we have changed the version. But Mm -hmm, the way that mm -hmm. that works now is it's no longer we change the version in the mix file. We change the version in the version file because it's a lot easier for me to figure out if there was a git change in a single file than it is for me to grip through. Is was there a line that matches this inside of a a git diff or whatever? Right. But that the mix file will just use that. Exactly. It's it's just rigged up to where it has its own internal function that just reads this file that's local to it so that it can can Mm -hmm. get the version number. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So if we change that file, then and we merge the pull request, it's going to go build itself and deploy itself out to an application without us needing to touch anything. That'll be pretty cool, too, though, because then we could like if we want to deploy some changes that we really don't like care if the public sees them yet, mm-hmm. like right away, we can just deploy without a version change. And then when we're ready to kind of like push this out, yep. then we could just update the version yeah so we can we can bulk things together if we want to do it in that way and then uh additionally like the other option is we could you know iterate on the version pretty rapidly but we can use like feature flags inside the application to determine whether or not certain things go out and i would like Ah, to get us like i'm gonna have a right now we're just gonna have a production server um because i mean production right because it's just for us eventually i'd probably like to have a staging server so we could dictate what we're sending out there and we can configure feature flags so that we turn on certain features inside of staging and not inside of production but that shouldn't be that big of a deal it'll require me to tweak some things inside of um inside of the circle ci config that might be a little bit irritating and i might have to have it build different release types and stuff but it should be okay nice cool yeah so that'll how how far do you think you are from from getting all that deployment 
CI DevOps stuff kind of done. Yeah. So once once this is done, which shouldn't be too far, I'm I'm pretty close. Like right now, I'm just finalizing like what the best and simplest way is for me to go from having a an application tarball somewhere inside. Like I might use uh, Spaces inside of DigitalOcean, which are kind of like S3 to to host our releases mm-hmm. that we package up. And then I can have our chef or like our chef configuration when it boots up a node to be like an Elixir or a chronic app node is what I'm calling it inside of our cookbooks is once it boots one of those up, it'll just go and look for a release like tarball in our spaces with a specific name that has the right checksum. So it'll know how to get latest basically. And it'll start running that off it. So like by itself. That's awesome. You should do a blog post on this. Or a video, like a Coder Journey video or something, because uh, that was like literally the number one question I received at the talk Mm -hmm. about Elixir is how, what do you guys use for deployment? Uh, And so I think like, and I talked to uh, somebody that runs kind of a local Elixir group and he's like, yeah, everybody's always wondering how how you deploy these applications so. well and that's the i've been listening to a lot of elixir podcasts recently and it there is mm-hmm. kind of this consensus in the community that otp releases are hard mm-hmm. uh, and i can kind of see where that's coming from in a way like if you just be, but there's like benefits over doing it like the the way where you just ship the code to a server and use mix so yeah i, I probably should kind of jot this stuff down i'm definitely gonna remember these things because it's gonna be burned into my mind by the time i'm finished but yeah doing a blog post or a video or something could be kind of nice just to show that the different ways that you can kind of think about deploying things with elixir the pros and cons and maybe i'll, I'll open source the cookbook that i use for our application yeah, one of the things I like to do when I'm like working on large projects like this is like keep a journal. Yeah. And I think I talked about this before mm-hmm. where I like just jot down, you know, the date and then like, hey, I figured this out or I still don't like how this works or I don't understand this. And that like lets me go back through if I'm ever like, you know, somebody asked me, hey, how did you, you know, do this? And then you can just kind of grip through your, your journal and, and find how you got to the path that you ended up at. Mm-hmm. The other thing we talked about uh, real quick um, was, you know, changing our marketing page that we currently have, quote unquote, marketing page, which is just a product hunt ship page. Which apparently is Um, mind bogglingly expensive for what it is. It is. It is. I think I pay $60 a month. Yeah. For like. That's a travesty. Or a certain amount. Yeah. I always have. I also have another app up there called Break Time, which. I was going, we might build alongside for chronic to, to do anyway, another application. So we talked about moving this over to just like a static site that kind of explains where we're coming from and what chronic is going to be Mm -hmm. and kind of promoting that a bit more instead of just building this kind of in a silo and talking about on this podcast. So I'm wondering if like adding a blog to that and and kind of driving traffic to that that way would would help. Yeah, that that actually sounds like a good idea because I could put it on like Coder Journey, uh, except for Coder Journey is not like a blog, right? Like every right. blog esque thing has a video. It's there's right. never been just a written piece of content on the site. So that's something that I yeah wouldn't necessarily uh, probably put there, but yeah, it would totally make sense to to put it on this. Yeah. So yeah, I might have to do that. And I can whip up like a static site using like Hugo really easily and just put it on Netlify. And then we have the benefits of like, you know, automatic uh, SSL and easy to hook up to a domain and all that jazz. So that'd be good. And writing kind of this slash purpose page will kind of help us as well, like hash out, you know, make sure that we're still on the same page and make sure, you know, like putting our, our, our thoughts into words that are coherent yep will, will, will help us as well and help the direction of of the application so that's the other thing we we want to work on yeah definitely uh seems like something we could do i remember we were talking about this a few days ago and i was like yeah do we have the same elevator pitch because i you know exactly. <laughs> i'm not sure if do we, we do even have do we even have an elevator pitch it's always hard for me to to kind of come up with that mm-hmm and yeah, you write this well, but like if somebody says, Hey, what's chronic? And you're like, Oh, it's like a Pomodoro app, but it's 
got all these other things. It's not really a good elevator pitch. Yeah, I've I've ditched the. It's like a it's a Pomodoro app. Um, yeah, I've gone to the sort of talking about like every you know the one thing in common for everybody is that like all of our days consist of time and uh, planning what you do with your time and kind of knowing how things are going through that uh, is really beneficial. And what would it look like if you could automate things based on that time? Right. So that's, exactly. that's where I've landed. Yep. I agree. I don't really want the word Pomodoro in any part of this. Mm-hmm. Although if we start reading, well, you know, working on elevator pitch, it may be, you know, we end up there. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, that's one thing we're going to work on. Anything else you want to talk about? Um, I mean, I'm moving, so I'm actually not even going to have the internet starting Monday until like Wednesday or Thursday. So that'll be fun. Oh I'll my be gosh. Off, that's not like the first thing. Off the grid. That's not like the first thing that you uh, had put in your house. So I scheduled it before I knew the exact time that we were closing. So I was like, will I actually have keys to the house by the time they would be there? So I, I delayed it by a day. And then I realized that I actually delayed it by two days. <laughs> and uh, didn't reschedule it because I was like, oh, I'll have plenty of stuff to do on Tuesday. I got to go, you know, to the license bureau and yeah. change of address. And that just, sounds fun. Yeah, run through and do all that stuff. Oh, man, I'm really excited. It's my first time, you know, first time homeowner here. So, yeah, uh, it'll be a good, good experience. Yeah, have fun with that closing. Make sure you uh, do some hand stretches. Yeah, uh, that I, I'm hoping it's sign. shorter this time. I signed like a thousand papers. I felt like the last time to the to where I signed my name wrong probably six times because I just type all the time anyway. I don't like my hand doesn't really remember the motion <laughs> for writing things, and <laughs> it was pretty embarrassing. <laughs> That's awesome. The other thing that we we're going to do is we're going to take a little hiatus. We're going to end end our season two for a few weeks while you move and I finish talks and we can kind of get our momentum back up on, on chronic. I'm like really, really excited to work on chronic and it kind of, it really bugs me that I can't. Mm -hmm. So I I think uh, we're going to take a little bit of hiatus and and work on that. And we'll have a lot of chronic talk to talk about um, our season three. And we're considering swapping the format a little bit for season three also to be less of a, like, right. here's what you did. This is what I'm going to do right. sort of format and more just talking shop, I think. Right. Yeah. More talking the details, kind of what we did today a little bit. You know, we got really dove deep into like deployment and DevOpsy stuff mm-hmm. uh, and a little bit into OTP. So, uh, yeah, I think like less of like, here's what we did on other stuff and more just focusing on chronic. And that sounds good to me. So we we're talking maybe two, three months, maybe August, September or something like that. Come back. Yep. Sounds good. Is that right? Okay. Cool. I'll talk to you later. Talk to you later.